This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open sourced Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code DEVCHAT at Sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code DEVCHAT at Sentry.io. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Ruby Rogues. This week on our panel, we have Dave Kimura. Hey, everyone. David Richards. Hello. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. And this week, we have a special guest, and that's Dan Mayer. Dan, do you want to say hi? Hello. How's it going, folks? It's going well. Do you want to just give a brief introduction, who you are, why you're famous, all that good stuff? (laughs) Not sure about famous, but uh, sure. So I'm the uh, director of software engineering at uh, Zola Electric. We design and sell microscale uh, solar systems in five African markets with a like kind of IoT microsystems that can scale up to handle, I guess, grid replacement at the high end, but on the low end, it's like three light bulbs and a cell phone charger. Awesome. And uh, we brought you on to talk about benchmarking and performance. And it seems like we've been talking a lot about this. A lot of people are thinking about it and concerned about it. Some people look to solutions like Elixir for parallelization and other people look more toward tools like this. And we talked about RB Spy a few weeks ago you know, to kind of get an idea of what they can do to make their Ruby stuff faster. And you were telling us kind of how you got into this. Do you want to just give us uh, sort of a short timeline on, on on how this all came about? Yeah, it's definitely kind of been a, an interesting journey because I think some of this work started seven years ago or more. And RB Spy actually fits into the, the timeline because it's one of the things that rekindled my interest in in how to capture we'll say like code usage and line usage at runtime. Um, But about uh, seven years ago, I was working at a a large consumer facing site that had a very large legacy Rails app. That application uh, over a number of years had built up a bunch of dusty corners that were no longer in use. Uh, And we're spending a lot of developer time trying to track down and remove dead code paths that were not worth maintaining anymore uh, and causing bugs and confusion for the developers. So I, I worked on, and at that time, I guess, Ruby 1.9, an ability to track uh, production code coverage. So you could see on your uh, deployed application what lines were getting hit, how often. But this had a, a fairly significant performance impact. So I was spending a lot of time trying to tweak that and, and find ways to do that faster so you could capture the data without impacting your users. At the time, I was using... Tracepoint, which is uh, an API that would let you kind of uh, capture all the line usage, but the overhead was fairly significant. So the the trade-off there was doing sampling. And then I I kind of moved on from that project when I left the company. I didn't really have a need for it, but it it gained notoriety in the community, I guess. Uh, So Coverband is the, the gem that does this production code monitoring, and it's been pretty popular. But then a few years or about a year ago, I started having a need for it again. So I was revisiting what you could do with uh, capturing production data and looking at using just Ruby standard lib coverage versus Tracepoint, uh, because I thought that would be a much better use case and it'd be faster. And I actually looked at trying to modify how coverage was implemented in Ruby. So it'd be uh, a better fit for this. And, And that's when basically Aaron Patterson said, prove that it's slow. So that got me into deeper benchmarking <laughs> around this. And, and he was right. It, it really wasn't the kind of bottleneck that I was seeing in the application. And, th- and that drove me to the point that I rewrote large portions of cover band using coverage versus trace point. And since then, now I'm rewriting it yet again, because I, I've moved, I removed one bottleneck to create another one, which eventually I found with benchmarking as well. So my experience with benchmarking basically comes down to, I think it's benchmark dot something or other, and then I just run something a whole bunch of times and see how fast it goes, right? 
And then if that number gets smaller, then I'm doing good or Ruby's doing good, I guess, if I upgraded Ruby. I mean, is, is it really that simple for everything or how do you benchmark things? Yeah, I think that's one of the, the kind of interesting journeys. If you start digging into benchmarking, there's so many different layers, right? When people talk about it, is a Ruby app fast? Like you can be looking at actually just the Ruby interpreter, how fast that is and spending a lot of time on that. And that's where I think recent conversations about performance have come up because the Ruby three by three, they're trying to have it three times faster on Ruby three than uh, Ruby two was. So a lot of efforts kind of gone into making Ruby faster, but when you're building an app, you actually care more about your, your app's performance, right? So now are you benchmarking end user performance? Are we talking about time to draw on the screen for an application? That's probably what you care about the most, but I've come at it kind of from the perspective of a gem author. So if you have a gem that's going to go into a whole bunch of, of different people's applications, you really want to ensure that, especially in this case, it's rack middleware. If you have middleware you that's getting hit on every request, you really don't want to impact that overall application. So that's where I've kind of spent most of my time trying to figure out the best ways to benchmark something that has a lot of different variables when it's actually deployed in the real world that aren't always under your control. And that's been, you know, uh, a different perspective, I think, than you always get when you're, you're just benchmarking, you know, a single method or, or a piece of code. So how do you go about benchmarking then something front to back? Do you plug in New Relic or Scout app or something like that? Or is there a better way? Yeah, I kind of look at benchmarking at the different layers. So if you're looking at whole app and you control the app, New Relic, Scout, and all of those are great. And you can basically see the the overall impact on like across a broad range, which is really helpful. But if you want to know like specific changes, it gets a little bit trickier. You could do individual deploys and just compare over time. But this is where I took a little bit of inspiration from, I think it's Noah on the for Ruby three by three, he's been working on a Rails benchmark is the project. And that's, sorry, I'm looking, Noah Gibbs. Mm -hmm. So Rails Ruby Bench is the the project he's been building. And he basically has kind of a sample Rails app and he uses AB Bench, which is the Apache benchmark tool to actually benchmark against this sample Rails app doing various actions. And this is supposed to help prove performance of Rails in general. Um, And my... theory on like uh, benchmarking gems was that you could basically set up a, a known Rails app and then you could change your gems or middleware or versions of a gems and run the same benchmark to actually capture how it's impacting the Rails app. Uh, so that was kind of the application level benchmarking. Um, yeah, we, we did an episode with Noah about that. He's using Discourse, which is the forum software. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because I guess they had their own benchmark, but but he decided it wasn't doing quite well well enough for what his purposes were. So he's extended their benchmark within this project, right? Yep. So I was looking at that. And originally, my plan was actually trying to just insert my gem into that project so I could run it with and without my gem and then with different versions of my gem. But I ran into a few issues and I've talked with uh, him about how to maybe resolve that, but we haven't quite gotten there. But I, I learned enough from what he was doing to to basically build a more simple version of that with a a kind of a basic Rails app that I could do the Apache Bench marking against. So with the coverage gem or cover band gem, how does it provide any kind of security so you're not kind of leaking out this information to end users? Gotcha. Yeah, so if you put this in uh, your middleware stack, uh, you essentially can control uh, a couple things. And this is back to the, the performance where, where there's impact. There's a, a cost of actually capturing and measuring like the performance at runtime. And then there's a cost of storing for reporting that coverage. And that's where you might get worried about um, somebody stealing this information and knowing more about your source code than you'd like. So in this case, I haven't ever set up like a cloud service or anything to make cover band run externally. It's expected to run on your full infrastructure. So you're either just writing the code usage to a local file or to Redis, uh, which would presume would be a Redis that you've secured uh, within your infrastructure. Okay. And then you can build whatever kind of views you want to trace back that information. 
So CoverBand actually uses uh, SimpleCov, uh, which is the same tool most people use for code coverage, uh, mm -hmm. which if you know the SimpleCov like HTML report you get, so CoverBand actually just ends up storing everything in a same format that you can use SimpleCov. So it, it uses the SimpleCov HTML reporter to give a visualization. And that's just generated locally or there's an adapter to stick it in S3 to view the data. So what is it? it it's not running tests then. So is it just running benchmarks against what every method you have in your app or how does that work? Gotcha. Yeah. So the, the benchmarkings basically for me and some other of the, the cover band authors to try to make sure it stays fast on the app. What it's, what cover band does is basically it's recording opposed to your test coverage. It's production code usage coverage. So if your users are doing a bunch of different paths and using old APIs and things like that, and you want to find that, say, version one of this API is no longer in use and you could delete all the code, CoverBand will find all the methods related to that API endpoint and say, like, these old models are never touched or these fields on the models aren't touched. So you could go delete all of those. Whereas tools like New Relic will show you a path and just say this endpoint's not used, but it won't necessarily help you find all the helpers and view files and models that are attached to that endpoint. I love that feeling when I can remove old code, when I feel safe and I can finally get rid of <laughs> a piece of junk that I wrote. <laughs> yeah, this the entire gem was always driven by my love of deleting code, like massive swaths of code. So if, I think the first time I've deploy, deployed CoverBand on almost any app, you let it run for a week, two, or a month, then you generate a report and then you can go delete like 10,000 lines of code. You're just like, wow, these old files have been sitting around. Nobody's executing them. They're not, they're not valid anymore. Let's get rid of them. <laughs> yeah, I've got a system that... This is off topic for benchmarking, I guess. But yeah. it's interesting what the, the gem does. Yeah, I have a system that I started Greenfield. And I started working on. And then I realized that I needed to restructure a whole bunch of stuff. And so I've been doing this massive refactor. And I know I'm missing stuff, <laughs> yep. right? And so, yeah, it's like, oh, I'll just, you know, once I have the refactor done, yeah, I'll just run this on there for a while. And anything that's not being used is going to get axed. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's entirely driven by that great feeling of a giant red pull request. It's like, look at all these codes, like lines going away. Yeah, and, and the thing is to get that feature, right? Since you're doing it in production at runtime, it can hurt your performance. And that's what's driven all the benchmarking on this over the years is the very first time I put this on a system in production, I think I had to remove it within minutes because I had made all web requests four times slower, which was not obviously acceptable for many businesses. So I basically went back to the drawing board to keep speeding this up. And like I mentioned in the past, the only way to do that for me was sampling. So it was basically saying, we can't record all coverage all the time. But if you record or capture 1% of your production usage and you have a really high volume app, that's still interesting or good enough. And that's, that's what I was doing for a number of years until this more recent set of benchmarkings helped me drive everything to the point that now capturing code usage in production is far less than a 1% overhead. It's unmeasurable, actually, in the general benchmarking tools. So I was using kind of smaller micro benchmarks for that kind of check, uh, where I check just the middleware, where I basically spin up a fake rack app, I use a benchmark, and I hit that rack app a number of times and have my my code inserted. And I use that benchmark gem that I think you mentioned earlier to check that. And my old version was generally running somewhere around 1.7 times slower. So that's where the only way to make that okay on production was the sampling. But after Aaron basically told me coverage is fast enough, stop trying to change Ruby, just you know use it and figure out a better way to use it. I started benchmarking that and basically I could no longer detect a difference in terms of using the regular benchmark tool. I decided that meant my benchmark wasn't good enough. So I actually, I, I moved to, I think it's benchmark IPS. So opposed to the, the standard Ruby gem for benchmarking, it gives much nicer output and it supports comparing across Ruby versions and some other nice features. And it, it reports everything in iterations per second, which was a lot nicer to read and, and interpret. And when I had that, I realized my benchmark was too small to really detect much, except for how slow my, my previous implementation was. 
So that one, I could finally show a difference if I'd let it run for maybe uh, 30 seconds at a time on both implementations. But it was still saying that it's like less than a 1% difference. So it's not anything that would concern most people when running in pr- production. So is there added memory usage to this? You know, is that kind of where it takes the hit? Or is it really just a low overhead addition that you can add in to get this kind of insight? So this is where I thought, back to the benchmarking at different levels, I thought I had found you know, the, the silver bullet uh, when I first kind of discovered this. I rewrote the, the library around coverage, dropped the, the kind of trace point, and I put it out. And it worked great for myself and my company's code because we have mostly internal tools with fairly low volume and we didn't see any performance at back. So it's been running for a while and I had other folks using it, but they were also coming back saying, hey, there's this really big performance hit once in a while that's causing us not to want this in production and like we need to pull it out. And the thing was, I went from needing to sample to being able to capture 100% of the requests really fast to the new bottleneck was when you captured all this data, it was actually capturing a lot more than TracePoint because it captures all the code usage of your gems, uh, all the code usage of like standard lib stuff, like everything that's used. So it went from just recording the small set of files in your, your API after your middleware was hit. So just basically your custom code to recording all Ruby code. So where it started to slow down was uh, reporting that. So most people were putting it in Redis. So the network traffic to and from Redis and opposed to sampling, you are now trying to store that, say, every thousandth request on your server. Every thousandth request, you would have this really bad slow request. And that's where I didn't have any benchmarks that would capture that. My A-B test benchmark should, but actually when you start reporting kind of on the average or the mean, it gets it disappeared. So what I was failing to do was capture these outliers that really for high volume customer sites, when every thousandth request started running at with an extra second and a half of overhead, they, they're coming back to me and saying, hey, this isn't really acceptable, which kind of drove my next set of, of benchmarking to say, hey, what can I do to capture that? Where can you start to capture that as you're making changes to this, this gem that's in the middle of people's runtime? And I, I guess I can talk about kind of what I did do to actually address that if, if folks are interested. Yeah, that seems like something that'd be a little bit tricky, right? Is, I mean, I've run benchmarks on like methods out of a model or something, right? That in, in Rails, but it's, it's a method that I can just kind of feed it a value. And so it's pretty consistent. So yeah, looking at, okay, how much memory is my app using? How much CPU is my app using? You know, I've got all these other things that are built on top of it and all these other things that run underneath it. Yeah, it's like, how can you even begin to isolate it? Yeah, and again, on the whole different kinds of benchmarking, like I'm not even really talking about or have started benchmarking memory. I know there's a slight memory increase, but I believe it's in the range of a couple MB per process. But I actually haven't benchmarked that yet because it hasn't been any any of the feedback or problems I, I've heard from folks is the the memory cost. But to get at these different levels where now I'm benchmarking on only the outliers when you do this reporting to kind of store something, how do we ensure that's fast? It basically was a, a new challenge to me. And once I knew it was the reporting, it's easy to build that micro benchmark around just the reporting. I could say, hey, throw out the rest of the code. We know it's the basically the save that's the problem. You can generate a really big fake report and save it a thousand times. And that was that was kind of the new benchmark for that. But the fact that all our other benchmarks previously had missed that as an outlier being an issue, and that even in New Relic, when I have this on production apps, it wasn't really showing up because New Relic kind of smooths over uh, a lot of that with averages. You, I did go back and actually see in New Relic, it was captured in the slow requests report. So you can say, what are a few slow requests once in a while? It was capturing these, these reports as outliers. But it wasn't something that when I deployed and just looked at it over like a week's time that I noticed any difference. So this was kind of an area that I was like, wow, there's a, a blind spot in all the benchmarks that's been, that I've written over the years that missed this. So it sounds like to me, I mean, this is awesome how you get right down to what matters to you, but it sounds like this has become a, a practice over the years, like you were saying. Mm-hmm. 
you just mix this into your regular workflow. You don't just stop and start benchmarking. Is that, is that how you handle it or how do you like to, to use this? Yeah, that's something I think is, is kind of an interesting thing to think about for, for people's standard applications. So uh, when I started doing a lot of this benchmarking, it was a one-off. I had to solve a problem. So I'd benchmark something until I could resolve it. And then I'd kind of I'd possibly throw it out or it's in a different place and I'd lose it. But especially getting PRs from other people that might not be as familiar with how the, the system works. There was several regressions. I'd fix something, a regression happens, and then there'd be a version that was much slower. We'd go back and address it. So what, I, what I've started to do is try to incorporate all the benchmarks directly into the test suite uh, for this gem. Uh, so essentially, when you're running the tests and anybody has a PR, we can also see the output of the benchmarks and say, hey, is this generally slower than it was in the last release, and and we can try to enforce that essentially every release is faster than the last one or equal performance, which I think uh, back to the Ruby three by three goals. Some people have proposed how could we have some standard metrics to know Ruby three is really faster in a bunch of use cases. If there was a way to kind of generalize this and say a bunch of gem authors have a way to easily say with my gem and a version of Ruby to record a benchmark and then do it again with a different version of Ruby and compare that output so there's some standard around how to do that, I think it could be a a really cool thing for the community. But since I've still been so, we'll say, deep into learning about how to do better benchmarking myself, I haven't really gotten to the point of how could we do this as a community uh, better in a way that could really help everybody. One thing that comes to mind is that maybe in a specific company, you know, building that culture of appreciating, you know, well, well well-crafted software that actually does well, it might be to just start measuring what customer output is, you know, Hey, it's faster. I know that in one of the Obama, um, um, uh, campaigns, they measured the benchmark speed of the site for the donations and could measure a difference in donations. And so maybe in our organizations, we could do similar types of things of, well, when we speed it up, we tend to have this behavior and this has value to the company. Um, Just a way to translate our efforts to things people outside of development might care about. It's nice to have something beautiful, but, and, and that works well, but it's also nice to show that this is actually moving the whole company forward. Yeah, I think if you get back to like your application and how most people, what they really care about is their application or their company's application. Like that's a really great way to think about it. And then what you could start saying is like, these are the few customer facing like key paths and we've added some benchmark tests on them. And even in CI, we just ensure that all the changes that don't break the or slow down the key pass. So that might be your purchase flow um, for, for an application. Um, like that could be really powerful for a team because it's you do a code review, this looks great, all the test pass, you deploy it. How often are people really noticing that you just slowed your purchase flow down by 20% if you don't enforce that with some some benchmarks incorporated into your, your CI machine. Yeah. I, I love that. Putting it into CI, I, I find that my little brain can't keep up with all the things I'd like to do. And so automating as much as I can just takes that pressure right off of me and I can do one thing at a time. Yeah. Automation. Yeah, no. And the other thing is, is recording all of the things in your head that you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and in a lot of cases, I mean, we're talking about this right now. You can record it to uh you know, to your backlog or whatever, or you can record some of it in these tests and benchmarks and stuff like that. Yeah. And that's the process and workflow I've really enjoyed because with this gem over the years, like I said, I, I've fixed some of these performance issues a couple of times and they, they've come back. But now that I've started to really put it into the test suite and into uh, CI, so these run on like Travis CI now, I have much higher confidence that will capture things before they get released opposed to some release goes out and I have to quickly follow up with a a perf fix release. It's like, oops, sorry, we didn't realize this change, you know, slowed this down for everybody. And having that kind of methodology around benchmarking and building processes around it is, is I think where it can be really powerful for teams. Hey folks, have you tried out RubyMine? RubyMine is an IDE dedicated to Ruby and Rails development. It allows you to quickly find and fix code smells, refactor code, 
and develop faster thanks to smart auto completion suggestions. RubyMine comes with a powerful GUI based testing and debugging suites. With three major releases a year, the IDE continuously becomes more robust and adds more features. Learn more and get a 30 day trial at devchat.tv slash RubyMine. Yeah, and I think it's also good to really see where your application is getting used the most. So we talked about the one spectrum of being able to uh, delete a lot of unused code, but then also to see where you have the most code usage. Usually, you know, you develop an application and you think that, I think that this is how my users are going to use this application. But long and behold, they're using it in a completely different way than you anticipated in many scenarios. And so you're getting a lot of usage in one area that you just didn't think that you would. And that can un uncover areas where you can speed up those performance if those areas are slow. Because I work on some applications that have thousands of calculations that are running through on each request, and it can get slow. But we're finding that in some areas where we did not think people would be spending a lot of time on, that's actually where they are going to be spending most of their time, just because that's how they're using the software. So it can really uncover some unknowns that you really didn't realize before of the user usage. Yeah, and that's actually a great story back on regressions on benchmarking or performance. So the original cover band only had hit or not hit. So it was really just, was this line ever hit in production or was it not? Somebody came along and kept basically pushing your use case saying, I want to know how much something has hit the frequency. So mm -hmm. we knew we had that data, but we weren't really capturing it or saving it, which was mostly again, related to performance. We were trying to really keep that down. So we added that in and thought it was, it was fast enough, but the very first release of that feature actually slowed a ton of people down and we got a bunch of bug reports about hurting their performance. Okay. And again, we didn't at that time, that was a few years ago, so we didn't have any benchmarks in place as part of the process. And if we had, if that was part of our test suite where we were benchmarking these uh, and reviewing the performance changes as part of PRs, we probably could have caught that before the release went out. But I, I think it, it was a really great feature and we, we've always tried to keep it around since then. But it is one of those, oh, feature versus performance trade-off or should we make this an optional feature? So you could say, I really, that's for me, I don't care about that. I just want as fast as you can or that is really good data. Let's capture it and collect it. But I understand there's this level of uh, performance cost to doing so. Um, and with benchmarking, you could actually tell people what that cost is. That's cool. One thing that I find kind of interesting, if you looked at, you know, the Rails guides for Rails, they have all these lists uh, with really good documentation on how to do various things. I believe the Rails performance, performance testing on the guides has gone blank, essentially. So there is a bunch of docs on how to do good Rails performance testing back in Rails 3, but in Rails 5, the guides no longer have any information. And that's something where there's so much talk about performance lately and benchmarking, but I feel like the there's some of it's also been lost where we're like there's a little less interest on how to do this within a, a specific Rails application. Yeah, it's it's interesting how the trends of our community really change. You know, sometimes we'll really get into testing or into benchmarking, or we'll get into software craftsmanship, or we get into just um, building better teams. You know, and we we tend to try to figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, the zeitgeist of our community seems to focus on one or two things and then goes on to the next and the next. But it seems like our teams, our companies, they need to be able to slowly grab all of this and keep it. You know, it's, it's good. It works. It adds value. You know, it's provable. So even if the community kind of loses interest or they're just worried about making Ruby better or just worried about other meta systems better. Well, yeah, but my project matters too. <laughs> so learning to learning to be a, a leader in the small, I guess, learning to to handle things here and gently keep the ball rolling where where I work. Yeah, and and I think kind of you mentioned the fads of things that come in and out. This is I think it shows this it was really popular for a while. It kind of dis disappeared from the community a little bit. And it's definitely coming back. It's, it's a, a part of the conversation a lot is this performance uh, within the Ruby world. 
my theory on why this like had guides and stuff in rails three and why there is no longer how to do performance testing on rails on rails five and whatnot is that the, the tools have gotten so much better that people aren't doing as much themselves like new relic scout uh, and whatnot have really offloaded a lot of that for people. But I think some of the, um, the stories that we've kind of talked about today uh, show where it doesn't do everything right where there, there's still, there's still a missing piece where if you want to put this into your CI flow and try to capture things before they're going live, that's maybe a gap in the community's tool set. Yeah. Well, and that's, it's valuable too, to see, I've noticed that like, you know, it's great if a vendor product can come in and, and handle things It took me a lot of time. But one thing I've noticed when I work with other languages outside of Ruby is just how incredibly rich our our pragmatism is we've really have deep roots in, in getting things to work, you know, and I'll go to another language and they're, they're enamored sometimes with the features of their language or one little aspect, but the whole package, this is how we benchmark. This is how we test. This is how we treat each other. This is how we deliver early and often. You know, all the, all the tools and the, and the toolkit seem to be working fairly well in our community where I always miss Ruby every time I step away, <laughs> I have to do a project some other way. And I, and I wish I had some of the Ruby community that would be with me sometimes. Yeah. I forget how long I've been doing Ruby now, but I keep trying because, you know, it sounds cool to do something in Elixir with its kind of support for high concurrency and whatnot. And, and at my company, we actually do use Elixir some, but I just can't get as into it. I really enjoy the the Ruby community, the tools, the way folks tend to work. And I find it drags me back whenever I try to like branch out and use another language. I never can go as deep as I have within uh, the Ruby world. <laughs> I always know which, which language is closest to my heart when the pressure is high and I've got to reach for something fast and it keeps being Ruby. Like, okay, so that's where my heart is. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh... It's definitely the the tool I'll reach for first or most often. It, it, it is good to know, I guess, it, where it does fall a little short. And maybe that is why the community talks about the, the performance stuff so often is that it's an easy thing other folks often point to. They're like, Ruby's so slow. And most of the time, I feel like there's very good ways in Ruby to handle that. But it, it is one of those we'd like to just have a better answer as a community, maybe for people coming in and saying Ruby's slow and be like, well, that's not really as true as it used to be. I guess in, in terms of benchmarking in your own projects and, and whatnot, is it something people have thought of more as a continual thing or is it generally kind of just a one-off? You reach for it because there's a problem. You see an issue in an app or you see an issue in New Relic and the benchmarks are just to resolve a bug and move on. I'll admit I'm, that it's generally to resolve an issue here or there. <laughs> I was phrasing my admission the same way, I'll admit. <laughs> yeah, it usually is I'm, I'm happy doing the wrong thing until I realize it's not working. And then, oh yeah, <laughs> I've got a benchmark. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I need to come back to this old thing that I didn't think about. One thing that I will say though is that when I go in and do the benchmarks, I have actually added in my test suite a tripwire that validates that the benchmark is under a certain point. But you have to have continuous integration and things like that set up because generally it's not worth doing as part of your test suite that you run every time on your on your development machine anyway. And so I, I have done that before too and, and set up benchmarks in a test suite so that it gets tested routinely. Nice. Yeah, if I did that, my test would never pass. <laughs> <laughs> That is definitely Index. a problem, right? Use indexes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if you run your tests on different machines or uh, the cloud systems, because the performance can vary a lot from run to run on something like Travis CI, that's something I've been thinking more about is like, how can you do that reliably uh, in a way that it's like, you still get the value of it being really in your tests, but you don't have a bunch of false failures. <laughs> Basically, right now, I output the data, but it's a, just a human has to kind of compare it. Like, is this slower or faster? And I haven't actually started failing CI on the, the test, but I'd actually love to get to that point. Uh, but that's because they were they were causing these false failures, which was confusing uh, to folks. And for my applications, usually I kind of know what the heavy hitting parts are. And usually they're slow, not because of Ruby, but because of a poor architecture decision one way or another that we made. 
So a lot of times going back and refactoring those, even if it means breaking best practices, I would much rather not have good practices in some cases, you know, some areas within reason, if it means that my end users are going to get a 50 times speed bump, you know, so I think it's really a every situation you can go and just weigh it to see what's going to be best for your end user. Because ultimately, they're going to be the ones who bring in the money into your business. And that's what's important. You're not going to really get brownie points for having pretty code or clean code. If your code's getting used, then you know you want it to be fast or responsive. Yeah, I, I just want to add on to that. So when I add things into my uh, test suites and things like that, it's it's usually because there was some major, you know, performance hiccup, right? And so yeah, it's it's where it interrupts the the user flow. Mm-hmm. That that almost always what it boils down to. If it's fast enough, I'm not going to benchmark it because I don't care. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's where it, the benchmarking for a given project is so different, right? Like for an application, the way you benchmark it is probably only when it's been a problem for your users and then benchmarking like a a gem or a library. um, It's really how it could impact other people's apps. And then for the Ruby three by three, trying to prove that Ruby's three times faster is so interesting to me because it's like, what's that even mean for what, for what Ruby applications? And and that's where uh, I think Noah's done some great work on trying to actually say like, here's a good example project that can really, you know, show real world, performance improvements. I guess one last thing I, I kind of wanted to mention because I, I I just listened to the RB Spy podcast or version of this podcast uh, that came out. And Julia's work on that actually is partly what got me back into working on cover band because her tool, like I read some great posts about it, seemed really interesting. And I was thinking I could build a different version of cover band that would use RB spy. So you could basically go turn it on, use RB spy to collect the data and report it outside of uh, web requests and rails. So it, it'd go through like an RB spy kind of like adapter or background um, run. Um, in the end, I actually ended up deciding to just use the, the covered stuff. It worked well enough, but seeing that, this external rust process could actually get down to line number usage of a Ruby process from the the outside view was super interesting to me and made me start thinking of all these different ways you can get at this runtime coverage. And and, uh, that's what made me explore some different options beyond TracePoint, which at that point was really a pretty big performance hit. Yeah, that was a terrific episode. And it was really interesting just to dive into what RBSpy is capable of and what information it gives you. So... Yeah, I'd still love to play around with it. It just seems like a really cool thing to try to contribute to or add some code to. But I'd have to pick up a little bit of rust, I guess, if I want to get into it. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that you're working on these days that uh, we should keep an eye out for in this space? So right now, the the biggest thing is since we've the little group, there's about four or five people that have been pretty active on CoverBand recently discovered that the storage and saving is now our performance bottleneck versus capturing usage data. We, we've basically added a bunch of benchmarks. We proved it. And um, just a few days ago, we got our, our benchmarks to be 60 times faster on saving by rewriting our Redis adapter, which basically... Our Redis adapter had the N plus one kind of issue. So every time you added a file, it added another round trip back and forth to Redis. So we've gotten rid of that. And we're, we're working right now on getting CoverBand 3 out, which uses this new, new way of saving and storing information. So the biggest thing I'm working on is trying to release a simplified version of CoverBand that's almost 60 times faster on those outliers. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, that'll make it live after we kind of resolve a few of the bugs. Very cool. All right, let's go ahead and do some picks. Oh, before we do that, Dan, how do people find you online? I'm on GitHub and Twitter is Dan Mayer. So uh, pretty easy to find. Uh, and then my blog is mayordan.com. Uh, and that's where I, I write about coding and running teams and working distributed and that sort of thing. And Mayer is M-A-Y-E-R. That is correct. Thanks. For the listener. Yeah, I, I don't want them going and looking for mayor spelled like the political office, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. Maybe we'll call you Mayor Dan anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right, David, do you want to start us off with picks? 
Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now, and it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Yes, this has been great. What I love about this conversation today is it's all about the habits we build. So last time we talked about Creative Quest and building creative habits. And lately I've been listening to another book. Uh, I'm just going through audiobooks fast these days. This one's called Atomic Habits. It's by James Clear. And it's just about building small, simple, pragmatic tools into our lives. And, and what I love about pragmatism is that it's small, it's deliverable. It, it builds me <laughs> as well as builds my software and my, my projects and my companies. So Atomic Habits by James Clear is my pick today. Isn't that a newish book? Yeah, it just came out. In fact, I, the audiobook just came out today. So I saw it. I thought, oh, that's exactly what I've been thinking about. And so I grabbed it and I'm about a third of the way done with it already today. It's very, very well done book. Nice. David, or Dave, sorry. We have too many Daves. Uh, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying I was here first. So sorry, David. <laughs> <laughs> So my first pick is a program for the Mac called Easy Res, and it allows you to quickly change your screen resolution on your computer. So if you do a lot of screencast recording like I do weekly, uh, then changing my screen resolution, it's always a pain having to launch my system control panel and all that junk. But this allows me to have a little menu icon at the top that I'm able to just quickly drop down and change my screen resolution on the given monitor that I want. So it's a free app and it's super useful and it saves me a few clicks. And my second pick is a stupid obsession that I've had. So I used to eat chicken nuggets late at night at midnight, horrible for you, but I've given that up in favor of skinny pop. So just uh, sea salted skinny pop popcorn. It's pretty good. And it's only like 130 calories per three cups. So it's actually pretty, pretty decent, I guess. So I've been obsessed with popcorn lately. <laughs> nice. I'll jump in here with a few picks. One of them is a book uh, that I've been listening to. It's called Extreme Ownership. And it's by Jocko Willink and uh, Leif Babin. Or Leif Babin. And uh, they were Navy SEALs who, after they retired from the military, um, I guess some friends of theirs asked them to come and teach uh, leadership at their companies. And it turned out that uh, they got more and more in demand. And so they wrote um, their leadership principles into this book. And I've really enjoyed it. Interestingly enough, one of the things that I picked up from it, and I had a team meeting this morning with my editor and my production assistant. And yeah, I've, I've kind of slacked off on my own level of ownership on things. And uh, I've let them slide a little bit. And so I just kind of got in and said, Hey, folks, you know, this is where we're going. I'm sorry, I haven't been a terrific leader. And what's funny is, is that, you know, I thought, Oh, you know, these, these guys are going to be like, you know, he's, he's busted my chops on this stuff. And it turned out that they responded really, really well to it. And so it turns out that uh, if you're in a leadership position, people want to, you to actually lead. And the other thing is, is it also pushed me just to realize that in some ways I had hired these folks so that I could pass the buck on things that I didn't want to do. And I realized that I have to take ownership of all of it, even the stuff that I have delegated. And so uh, really, really interesting book, uh, an interesting approach to it. Jocko Willink also has a podcast 
I haven't listened to it, but I hear it's terrific. Um, and I think it's just the Jocko podcast or the Jocko show. I'll put a link to it in the show notes because I'm, I'm planning to subscribe to it. But anyway, super excited about the ideas in here and made me realize that if I want things to go a certain way, then I've got to take responsibility for them and own them. So, and responsibility equals ownership to a large, very, very large degree. So anyway, uh, really enjoying that. And then I've also gone back on the ketogenic diet. And it's funny because I've, I've done it hardcore for about a week now. I did it before. I'm diabetic and it, it helped all my numbers. But I, I was just like, you know, I just got to do this. And I have be, been feeling so good lately. So if you're interested in the ketogenic diet, go check out ketogenicforums.com and twoketodudes.com. And yeah, uh, just jump in and try it. Just really, really digging it. So anyway, those are my picks. Dan, do you have some picks for us? Sure. Those uh, earlier, both books recommended sound interesting. So I might have to check those out. This isn't, uh, I guess, a kind of programming or a method book, but I, I recently finished Artemis. So that's the, the Andy Weir follow-up after The Martian. Uh, obviously not like a sequel or anything, but uh, it's a good sci-fi read if you enjoy some silly sci-fi once in a while. So that's my favorite book of recent times. And then if you are playing around with Elixir, which I keep you know trying to do, even though my, my heart brings me back to Ruby, there was a recent series of posts on Active Record versus Ecto. So it's specifically about the the frameworks of interacting with the the databases. And I can throw the links into chat and get those in the show notes. But the uh, it was a two-part series on the differences. And it's it's really kind of interesting to see how the the different frameworks approach uh, interacting with the database. Cool. Yeah, we have an Elixir show. In fact, I'm recording it in about 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> and so nice. people can check that out. And uh, yeah, I read Artemis and I enjoyed it. I felt like it was, it, it had a few too many sci-fi tropes in it. I mean, it was really well written. Uh, the characters were likable. Um, I think the main difference between the two, honestly, is that, um, uh, what's the name of the guy in The Martian? Um, anyway, the main character in The Martian is much more interesting than the main characters in Artemis. And I think that's what really made the difference in those books. But, yeah, I still preferred The Martian. I, I thought that was better, but it was still a fun, a fun read. But uh, definitely it's enough that I'll probably still pick up whatever else he puts out next. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm dogging the book. I did really enjoy it. Nice. I just enjoyed The Martian more <laughs> and I can tell you why. So yeah. anyway, well, thanks for coming, Dan. Yeah, thanks for sharing your expertise. I'm definitely going to be putting cover band in my apps. So I, I like the, uh, the approach there as well. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. It was uh, fun to hear everybody's thoughts on some of the, the performance changes or at least conversations going on in the community. Yeah. And we've, we've done other performance episodes recently. So if you're interested in any of those, uh, go check them out. Uh, the three by three stuff is interesting. And Matt's has actually talked about three by three in a few places, including at Ruby Dev Summit last year. So um, if you're interested in any of that stuff, uh, definitely go check out that stuff and we'll put a few more links in the show notes. Talk to you later, guys. Yep. Bye. Thanks. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.